You're listening to Behind the Hype, where we delve into the stories of artists who are making waves in the digital world, shining a light on their unique journey and creative process as we discuss key moments that propelled them into the spotlight. I'm Shay Connolly. And I'm Mark Conway. Let's get into it. And just like that. Violetta Zaroni is a singer, songwriter and actress. After being signed to a major label as a teenager and wowing audiences around Europe, she has since emerged as a critically acclaimed independent artist renowned for her timeless tunes and global festival appearances. 2022 was a game changer for Violetta. She dived into the music NFT world, releasing two hit collections, Moonshot and Another Life. Moonshot smashed records, becoming the best-selling music NFT collection by a female singer-songwriter globally, and birthing her new devoted fan base named Moonshotters. Oh my extraordinary love, you whatever you Thanks to our sponsors at Massive, we like to kick off these podcasts by asking our guest, who are you a Massive fan of? Okay, now I think I'm obsessed with... She's a folk, kind of Americana artist that I found here in Nashville. Um, Her name is Sierra Farrell. If you don't know her, check her out. She's incredible. Like, I've got, actually, I've got her vinyl right here. I'm going to show you right now. There you go. Oh, wow. I know, because I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed <laughs> right now. I went to see her a couple of weeks ago and I bought the record and then I got her to sign it. I was like, oh my God. And then I saw someone had a gold vinyl and I was like, where did you get that? <laughs> like a rubber NFT freak, like a DJ. I want the gold, you know? Um, yeah, I love her. You know, she has this amazing voice. Like it's a timeless voice. You know, it doesn't feel like it's from 2023. Uh, and she doesn't care about anything. She goes out and grinds, plays 200 shows a year. I love her. Violetta talks to us from her new home base in the heart of America's music city, Nashville, Tennessee. Yeah, so the, the past year, Violetta, obviously you've just passed the one-year anniversary of Moonshot. How do you reflect on the past year? It's probably been pretty crazy for you. Yes, uh, absolutely crazy, absolutely crazy. Uh, I, I can't even wrap my head around it, really. Um, but, you know, it, it's been one of those things that now I'm like, okay, well, that that was unexpected but it didn't just come to me so and it actually was like a lot a lot of like sacrifices and a lot of work and a lot of exhaustion so I look back almost like you know I want to give myself a hug and you know the community a hug because it was definitely a lot of work uh and I didn't I wouldn't have expected it but you know I worked for it so I was hoping for this result definitely Amazing. I mean, when you say sacrifices, I think I, I know what you're saying, but is it what, what sort of sacrifices have you had, had to make over the past year to, to reach this point? It, it was all things that I was happy to give up, you know, because for me this was more important, but I did, you know, sacrifice a lot of, you know, normal life for sure. So I sacrificed my social life entirely. You know, I, well, I moved it to the internet, I guess, (laughs) you know, my in real life, social life, I basically lost all my friends, you know, personal life, like, you know, definitely felt it, uh, didn't see my family for a long time and, you know, really, um, prioritized this over everything else, which again, I feel lucky that I can do this, you know, there's worse there's like, you know, this is amazing. You know, there's really bad things in the world. This is amazing. But I don't know if, you know, a lot of people, you know, maybe come into the space and they're not willing to maybe give up like going out, you know, or, or going to the movies or 
eating good food, you know, or anything like for, I, I'm serious. So like I sacrifice a lot of showers, you know, <laughs> a lot of meals and, you know, I'm not going to like, I don't want to advocate, you know, and say, okay, this is easy. You know, you can totally find a balance. Like I had no balance at all. So, you know, it was, it was rough, but a hundred percent worth it. So when you say that, it, um, was rough. Would you say that period was the entire year or are you finding that balance again now? I'm definitely getting closer to somewhat of a balance, you know, uh, like, like most of the artists in the space, to be honest, I'm like a one person, one person team. I have my dev and then there's me, you know? So everything that you see, um, uh, about my projects, I'm doing it except for the smart contracts, pretty much. Of course, I hire, you know, like an artist and stuff, but everything, the direction of the whole thing is, and the execution of a lot of it is is just me, right? So I, I still, you know, work a lot and I do find a little bit more of a balance in a way that like I reserve one and a half day a week where I go for a walk. You know, that's like, like I learned to appreciate the simple things again, because Mm -hmm. the first year you have to grind a lot, a lot, a lot. And then only later on, you can kind of reap those benefits of the hard work you did before. Right. Um, but yes, let's say 2022 was full on, like the whole year was pretty intense. Um, but listen, I've had some of the best moments of my life, you know, really unfor- unforgettable and I've never been happier. So I, I don't even think it's right of me to call those things sacrifices because I just, you know, uh, gained a lot of value in my life. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, we're really keen to hear from you about what NFTs are and also the Web3 space because obviously that's where what we're talking about and uh, some of our listeners might not be familiar with the tech. So please tell us tell us about uh, NFTs and why they are so important to you and how you, how you found them. Yeah, so NFTs for me are... Really, when it comes to, you know, music, because that's the thing I specialize in, I cannot express enough how much I think they are where the future of music uh, lays, you know, and and for so many reasons. NFTs, for those that are not familiar with the technology, uh, you know, like you said, they're just simply digital digital assets, right? Digital, when it comes to music, they're digital records. Think about a song, an album uh, that you buy online, right? So there's no real difference um, visually, you know what I mean? It's just like a thing on your computer, right? So that, that might seem like, well, why am I buying this? Well, there's a few things, right? It is verified on the blockchain that it's yours and it's immutable and it's there forever. Now, when you own something, it means you can pretty much do whatever you want with it. Whereas when you stream a song, you're just borrowing it for that two and a half minutes, right? It's not yours. But when you own a digital asset, you can do anything you want with it. And when it comes to music, uh, it comes with perks sometimes and utility and rewards that give you access to certain environments and situations and communities that you can be a part of. Um, But really what it represents, in my opinion, for artists is that direct um, connection between an artist and the consumer of their music. You know, that's the biggest value that I found in in Web3. And a lot of people say this kind of thing because, you know, they build communities on Twitter, on Discord. But I'm talking about the tech. Like when you sell or send one of your NFTs to someone, you have their record, right? You have their wallet address. You know exactly how to find them, how to reach them. You know, you can look at everything they do. So from a business and marketing standpoint as well, it's really valuable information that you have, right? If it's somebody that, you know, is active on the blockchain, um, you have a direct line of communication. You can send them things. You can even send them messages. Mm -hmm. You you can mint an NFT with a message on it. You know, I've done that a few times and that's a a way to connect, to communicate, right? Um, And there's nobody in between you, artist, and the recipient of your music, 
You don't need a distributor. You don't need a streaming platform. You don't need a manager. You don't need an agent. You don't need anything. You can self-distribute with nobody setting the rules for you. So I think that's the definition of freedom, which an artist should have. So, yeah. So cool. Thank you for that explanation. Yeah, I love that. I feel like um, NFTs are kind of punk rock, I think. Sometimes I think their branding's a bit off where artists are like, oh, no, they're, they're like lame or, I don't know, bad for the environment or whatever. I'm like, they're just they're kind of a new form of punk rock and like really artists first. Completely punk rock, you know, 100%. Our friend Ray Isla, she says that all the time. Web3 is punk, and if you don't think it is, you're sadly not so punk. That's our... <laughs> That's the way she defines it, which I absolutely love. Uh, and I think it's true. And, you know, another great thing about Web3 and, and like music in Web3 is that there's no like formula. There's no standards yet. As of right now, at least, um, there's no giants, you know, in the music industry that are telling artists, oh, you should price your music at that or your NFT should look like that. And there's restrictions. There's none. You know, so it, it becomes really subjective to the artists and the behavior of their community. You know, like I want to price my NFT a million dollars. I can do it. Maybe I won't find anyone who buys it, but I can, you know, and, and, and maybe I will find someone who buys it. Or I can price it at 50 cents and I can do that too, based on what I think I should do, you know, and, and that's just like, it's your decision and, and nobody can interfere with that. Do you remember the moment that you've discovered NFTs and, and how that came to be? Yeah, actually, it's pretty funny what happened. Um, so I was not a techie person at all. I had like an iPhone 6. Uh, like when I found NFTs, I had an iPhone 6, a MacBook Air from 2015. And it, I was just so like out of it completely. And not really informed on crypto at all. Uh, but I was about to, honestly, I, I was looking into doing something else with my life because I couldn't, um, you know, I couldn't pay my bills anymore. It was still COVID, right? COVID pandemic. And it wasn't resolving. In Europe, it was like the longest stretch ever. I was living in Germany and it was winter. There was no way of getting out and working. Um, and so I was looking into going to like college, you know, university or finding a job, whatever. Um, but then I went home for Christmas and my mom told me about NFTs because she, she's just like really curious and informed. She reads a lot of like, um, you know, news that just circulate in the world. And she's just really, um, you know, informed and she loves to look into things. And she was like, Hey, listen, I heard that this new N NFT thing like is, is going around and I, you know, Snoop Dogg did an NFT. So I think they're making music NFTs. Why don't you look into that? Maybe it's a new way of putting out your songs. And at the start I was like, that makes no sense. Like nobody's going to buy it. You know, like why would they buy an NFT for even like 10 bucks when it's free, right? Everywhere else music. But I was so desperate, right? I was like, this is it or nothing, right? So I just immediately, I didn't waste any time. You know, I was home for, for the holidays and I spent my holidays researching, researching. And yeah, and then I, I just dived in. Was there a moment it clicked for you where you're like, oh, now I get it. This is huge. I, yeah, the first thing that I that made me have that moment was, you know, when I saw a lot of like digital art as well. Um, I, you know, the thing that, that really got me into it was initially, okay, like this is a world for art, you know, for like fine art and digital art and there's art collectors uh, and it's a niche, you know, it's like a niche group of people that value arts more than, than like what I was used to. And, you know, for the longest time, people in the music industry had told me like, you know, you're a niche artist, like, you know, your audience is not, you know, the masses, whatever. And so I had that in my head and I thought, okay, maybe I can find those people in this world, 
you know, like target a specific kind of audience that I was told was my target audience. You know, maybe I can find it here because they might be used to um, collecting art. Uh, and so that was that was what drove me at the start. Um, but then I listened to actually a few po- podcasts. So I'm happy we're doing this podcast right now because it was really a podcast that got me really excited and it was a podcast from a music platform that was interviewing a few artists in each episode that had done well with web three music. So I heard spotty Wi-Fi, I heard nifty sax. I heard dill. I heard Latasha speak domino. And I was listening. I remember walking around the streets of my hometown in Italy and listening to these guys talk and explaining it. And, and that really opened up so much in my head. Um, and then I realized that I could talk to those people on Twitter. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I started just hanging out with them pretty much. And I think that was the day when I heard them speak and their backstories. So I'm happy we're doing this now. Oh, that's great. I'm so happy to hear that. And I think, yeah, that's the best thing when you do realize that there's people that you can reach out to and learn from. And you're like, hey, I can actually do this. Uh, so really want to talk about your first drop, Moonshot. That was obviously a massive success. So we'd love to hear about that and your creative process. Your cover art tells a story. So, yeah, please share that. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, Moonshot, so the music, um, you know, Moonshot is five songs, so it's an EP really. Um, and I wrote those songs over the previous couple years so I started writing it actually in 2019 so it's it's not like the the newest uh record but you know how they say like it takes you you have your whole life to write your first record and then you have a year to write your second one so you have to like make it just as just as good but you don't have enough time but anyway like I I pretty much worked my whole life towards that record that was like the record I thought okay this is like the essence of who I am artistically um and I came to Nashville actually and recorded it with a Grammy winning producer. He's uh, Willie Nelson's producer. I, you know, I, I spent all the money that I had. I asked for loans, got into debt to make like the best record I could possibly make because it was going to be my last one before I quit. I was like, you know, what? it's not working out. Um, but I want to still give it one last try, give myself a year, make this record first. And then within the next year, see if I can bring it to the next level. Um, and so I made this record. I was super happy with started shipping it, like shopping it to labels, you know, majors. And everyone was like, no, shutting the doors uh, on me. And so when I found NFTs, I first released a couple of, you know, acoustic songs just to test the grounds a little bit. And then when it came to, you know, releasing a bigger collection, I was talking to Nifty Sex, who was kind of mentoring me at the start. And, um, he was like, yeah, if you have a few songs, you know, you could do an album. And immediately I was like, I have the moonshot record. Maybe this is the time, you know, for that, wow. for that, uh, for that album that nobody's wanted <laughs> until now. And I put so much effort and money into, so I think, you know, now's the time. And, and then I, I started hearing, you know, people talking about certain topics that, and and they were relating to the songs as well. You know, I was singing them out on spaces all day, all night for months and, and people were resonating, like fire up my rocket ship. You know, I'm ready to risk it all. Like we are a moonshot. Like that's a sentiment that people feel in web three, you know? Um, yeah. And so, and so I decided to ask my dad, uh, to draw the art for me because he's a Disney artist. He works and he draws comics for Disney uh, for a long wow. time. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, yeah, it's cool. Yeah. And we never got the opportunity to collaborate before um, because, again, like people thought that, you know, Disney art is kind of childish, you know. And so in the Web 2 music industry, it's like, oh, if you're not a hipster, you know, with like, you know, AI you know, art or whatever, then you're not cool. And like Disney art is not cool. So, but in Web3, it was perfect. You know, it's all animation. So yeah. And also my dad knows me very well. And I wanted this first collection to be as authentic 
um, as possible. And um, so, yeah, he, he did the art for this, inspired by the lyrics of the songs, and we put it out, and we mint it out in five weeks, 2,500 NFTs, um, sold one by one, pretty much. Um, but yeah, and then since then, you know, it's, it's been a year, which is, which is crazy. What an amazing bonding moment between you and your dad. That's, that's so cool. Does your artistic instincts flow through him, do you think? Is that where your artistic flair comes from? I think so. Yeah, I think, you know, he's also a musician, you know, in as a hobby. You know, he loves music. He We've written songs together, and he's the one who always, always pushed me uh, to play music. And every time I wanted to quit piano lessons, he would, like, gaslight me. Like, it made me feel guilty because <laughs> he, he just wanted me to do it. Maybe because he could never do it or whatever. I don't know. But, you know, he really wanted me to do music. And, you know, we've had our ups and downs as well. Because, like, artists and artists, daughter and father can, like, crash sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, this gave us, gave us really the opportunity to do a collaboration where we weren't interfering with each other. Like, I had the songs and I didn't comment on his art i was like i trust you take the songs interpret them however you want this is the style kind of that i want 1960s cartoon vibe uh and he just did it and i said yes that's perfect so it was a great like you said um way of collaborating for sure and bonding it almost sounds as though nfts saved you i just it feels like a real crossroads moment do you ever wonder where you would be right now without them I don't really want to think about that. <laughs> like, it's, I actually, this is the first time that someone's ever asked me that question. And I haven't thought about it until now. Um, I think I don't see a life without it right now. I just don't even picture it because it would have been like the worst thing in the world. If I hadn't found this and I would have had to quit. I was thinking of going and working in a record label. Like that's, that's like a cry of despair, you know, (laughs) like, but it's, I don't know. One thing that, that is funny though. And I'll say this, um, I remember before, like a month before Moonshot minted a month and a half, maybe I went and auditioned for an HBO show, uh, to act in it, uh, quite a popular one, White Lotus that came out. Yes, recently. The second season was uh, filmed in Italy and set based in Italy as well. Which role, if I may ask? So I auditioned for both young girls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> First, I auditioned for Mia, the singer, and then the next day they got me to audition for the other girl. Um, well, I got to the very end of the audition rounds. So I did like five rounds and then ended up flying to Rome and auditioned in front of the director. Uh, for the one role and then they were like no not for this but come back tomorrow maybe for the other role so I went back the next day and and I was like damn like if I get this I have to give my availability for the next six months pretty much and I was planning the moonshot mint so and then I didn't get the role Uh, wow you would have been a great mayor (laughs) (laughs) on the piano and everything I know that's what like I learned all her lines the songs and everything for the audition uh but I thought it was weird and funny that I went and auditioned for the singer and then they're like no not for this but maybe for the escort you know (laughs) like the next day (laughs) so but no I'm glad that I didn't get it you know and I could do this but that maybe could have been something maybe I could have focused on the acting a little more you know were you able to watch the show or was that a bit weird because you didn't get it I watched a couple episodes, but I was like, you know what? I'm just going to bitch about this the whole time. So it's not worth <laughs> <laughs> You know? <laughs> I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> you were um, in a movie, though, right? Yes. I was on a Netflix yeah. movie. Yeah. Rose Island. That's the name. Rose Island. Yeah. So tell us about that experience. That was cool. Um, again, super random, you know, that I got that role because... I, you know, I, I never thought it's a comedy and I never thought I was like a funny 
actor or anything. And I didn't even grasp the tone of the movie un until I realized it was comedy because I went there and auditioned my part in a really dramatic way. And they were like, mm -mm, this is like friends timing, you know, like, <laughs> and I was like, okay, I'm going to have to redo it immediately. And I got that part. That was really cool. You know, it was at the time it was the biggest uh, European uh, Netflix original movie that they produced. Wow. Yeah, it was really nice. And, um, yeah, I just loved it. it again. Like it came, it was supposed to come out, you know, in 2020 and it did, and it had, it was supposed to have a lot more like clout to it, but then of course it was like pandemic. So we couldn't do all the red carpet stuff. Um, but it was still cool. You know, it was trending for a while on Netflix and yeah, I loved it. Yeah, Shay and I were talking earlier about your community. I know Shay sort of is a bit more in your community. We are both moonshot holders, though, um, so, uh, big fans. But, um, yeah, I know Shay wanted to ask you a bit about your community. Yeah, I, well, I just admire how much effort you put into it. I know that community is everything, and as you say, you do everything yourself. Um, and I read your updates and whatnot, and you contribute so much to the people that support you, Um so I just wanted to know how do, how do you, how does your community play in your creative process and do, do they help give you advice? Because I know that some collectors and community members actually sort of are quite involved in musicians um, in Web3, like their new projects that they drop and whatnot. So, yeah, how's that impacted you? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um yeah, like with, with Moonshot, you know, and I'm so, you know, glad to hear you both are in the community. Uh, thank you guys for the support. Um, I, I thrive so much off of the feedback. You know, I'm a very open person. I, you know, because I don't have a manager, because I don't have like strategists or experts assisting me or whatever, I like the feedback, you know, I really love putting out ideas and thinking out loud. You know, if you listen to my spaces, you hear me ramble a lot, but that's just me like thinking out loud, you know, and, and vocalizing my thoughts and just getting some kind of feedback. Um, and it's been the best thing for me. Like that's what I need as a person. Um, and I also feel like, you know, the community aspect um, you know, it's a great idea, you know, the fact that you have like a bunch of people just in general, the concept of a NFT community, you know, not just for music artists, but I see more and more projects, PFPs as well, having these council calls, you know, with their, mm -hmm. with their holders, cause they want to get the sentiment, you know, and those that don't sometimes suffer. It's a, it's a great idea. Like, why would you put the, the whole, like, you know, just two or three minds at something uh, when you're supposed to manage like 1,500 people, you know, wouldn't it be better to open the door to more people and hear what the majority thinks, you know? Um, but there is this kind of unspoken, you know, rule where it's like as long as the artist is authentic and has the freedom to be themselves, we're here to assist. And that's the value they offer me, you know, as an artist. Um, and the, one of the biggest takeaways, to be honest, if you guys, you know, want to hear an example, um, with Moonshot, you know, the way I recorded it was very pop, right? It was like really, really polished, you know, uh, very uh, meticulously edited and to make it perfect, right? For the radio, for Spotify, like that was the target. And then once I started singing the songs on the, on the spaces, people got used to hearing me live, you know, guitar and very like intimate, intimate performances. And then when I put out the NFTs and people could hear the recordings, they were like, oh, we love the recording, but we can't hear your voice. You know, like we love it more when you play live, and that was a huge insight wow. for me. Yeah. That, and they didn't criticize, you know, like, oh, you should change that baseline or whatever, like an A&R would do or like a manager would do, you know. They were like, 
yeah, these are cool. We understand why you have to record them like this, but we prefer it when it's live. Like that's when we feel really emotional. Um, mm. And uh, it was one specific holder. Her name is Shar. I can mention her because she's been there for, from the beginning. And she said, Violetta, we want to hear your voice. And so I was like, you know what? They're right. I think I'm going to record the next album very, very bare. Um, you know, just me on guitar and a couple other people completely live and try to, to capture that exact feeling that people get when they hear me live on Spaces. So we're going to do it on tape. Right. So it's immutable, just like the blockchain. You know, you're going to take the snapshot of the moment um, and and put it out. And that's what you get. It's not going to be perfect. Like it's not when I sing on spaces, but it's real. And so serendipitous, uh, serendip serendipitously, Char has the utility that allows her to come to the studio with me when I do my album. So she wow. came wow. all the way to Germany from America and was in the studio with me wow. for two days um, in the, in the analog studio that she, you know, that she kind of, she, she kind of provoked that artistic decision. She got to experience it with me. So that's amazing. So she's just hanging out in the studio while you're recording. <laughs> is she giving yeah. feedback or what, like what, what sort of role is she playing? Just hanging out. Hanging out, just like listening, having the experience, you know, living it with me. So it was awesome for me as well to have her because it was also because of her that I was there. Yeah. So, wow. can you tell us more about utility and your utility that you do include in your collections? Yeah, for sure. For me, utility is a really important part. Um, this that I just described is one of the top tier utilities that you get, um, that you can attend, uh, during my studio sessions and experience it, you know? Um, but I think, you know, eventually I want to get to a point in the future where like music will be the only utility needed, uh, at one point, like that's obviously my goal and the holders know that. Right. Um, but I'm also aware that, you know, right now we have so much to prove as music artists, we need to like reframe completely how people envision and experience music um, and how they perceive it. And so I think utility is really important right now to, to show those things, to show what it, what stays behind music, you know, what, like what it means to create music, what it means to live it and experience it and what it, and what it can really do when experienced on a deeper level to somebody's life. And so, because people take music for granted, you know, it plays in the background, it's free, you know, it's in every shop, yeah. in every corner, you know, but all these things that come with music are not everywhere. And so vinyl records are, you know, very big utility that I have. They get them completely free, uh, free prints, lifetime, free tickets to my shows. If you have, you know, certain bundles, um, custom songs that I write for my holders, uh, private shows they can book me for, you know, and, uh, that way, you know, certain utilities like those, like the custom songs and the private shows, you need quite a lot of NFTs to unlock those obviously, because they're big commitments. Um, but people can monetize on those things. So I see myself mm. as utility as well. I'm the IP instead of giving you right to my music. I'm, you have right to me, you know, you can book me for a show and charge 200 people $200 to come and see me, but I come for free, right? So you make your profit, mm. you know, mm. or you can use a song for your business and monetize on that commercial that you're selling with my song and you didn't pay because you have the NFT. So it's like, it's like when you buy a yearly membership, you know, like you get, I don't make money from you buying the yearly membership for me, but you're going to come back and buy drinks and like buy merch or whatever, you know? So it's like that exchange. You were lighting up then when you were talking about sort of music and uh, listening to music. I think I'm curious about your Genesis story and when you first sort of became aware of music, you mentioned your dad was an artist and, and what influenced you growing up, I guess, just sort of your journey before getting into NFTs and, you know, everything leading up to that. I'm curious about. Yeah. My journey with music starts really early. Uh, I joined a, a kid's children choir when I was three. I uh, started taking piano lessons when I was five. And uh, my dad was always pushing 
pushing. Like the moment he <laughs> realized I had an okay voice, he was like, okay, that's what she's doing. Um, but I was always very sensitive to sound. Like I've always been a big talker, you know, like I, you know, I would perceive different genres, you know, different languages. I was very sensitive to those kinds of things. So yeah, it's been my passion for the longest time. When I was in my teens, I started playing in some bands. I was in a band with my dad, kind of like playing locally at 16, 17, writing some songs. Um, and then when I was 18, I did X Factor Italy um, and got to the final and got signed to a major label on one of those cutthroat 360 deals that, that they offer. <laughs> Um, so, but yeah, I was like 18. I didn't know what I was doing. I just signed it without any legal assistance, really. Um, and found myself in a situation, realized what I'd done, uh, fought to get out, managed to get out after a couple of years, thankfully, uh, and then became independent basically. But, you know, influences growing up, you know, definitely a lot of jazz, a lot of Italian music, a lot of folk. Uh, I loved punk music as well for some reason for a long time. So, yeah. Um, and moving to America, you've obviously moved to Nashville. I'm curious, there's so many music scenes in the U.S. Is there a reason why Nashville jumped out? And I'm curious about the music scene there and, and what that's like. Yeah, Nashville jumped out It's because I had connections here, right? So I worked with a producer here. I'd been here a few times. There's a big scene for songwriters. Um, so I came here before a bunch of times to work and I just really liked the atmosphere, you know, there's a lot of musicians, but also a lot of norm, like not musicians. Um, but it's fun, you know, you can go out and listen to music whenever you want, any time of the day, you know, or as a musician, you can go out and play music, whatever you want, any time of the day. So that was one of the main reasons, like, okay, I'm doing NFTs, right? But if this doesn't work out, I can, if I'm in Nashville, like I can live from this, you know, I can go out and play, uh, um, in, in the city. Right. Um, and the, the scene here is mainly, you know, country music, of course, which, you know, I like, but not a huge fan of this modern country that they tend to love in Nashville. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it can be fun, but also a little bit much, you know, um, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's good. I like it. It's a really good spot and, and it's not too big either. So. Any culture shock moments in the U S or you're feeling pretty comfortable there? You know, the biggest problem I have here is that I don't have a driver's license. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm it's a big pretty- place, Nashville, isn't it? Well, yeah, it's not so big that it's not like LA, right? Where you have no public transportation and if you don't drive, you're done. Here, you can get an Uber. You know, I I do Ubers pretty much all the time and within 15 minutes you're on the other side of town. So it's it's fine. But like I don't I'm used to living in Europe walking everywhere, cycling yeah. everywhere. I have a Vespa in Italy, you know, those are my means of transportation. And here I just heard of people having Vespa accidents and breaking an arm uh, because the roads are busy and the grocery store is like half an hour walk. So like, yeah, it's not, it's not exactly practical, but yeah. I did want to jump back a little bit. I know you talked about how people don't value music anymore and um, we are living in a world where obviously streaming is king, not only with music but movies uh, and we're so interested to see musicians that are in the NFT and Web3 world actually move away from streaming completely and not even releasing their music there. So can you talk to us a little bit about that and your, I guess, strategy there? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that that's what I'm doing, right? Pretty much like I, I've decided to move away from streaming completely. Um, and look, I, I try to make these bold statements, you know, as well, because I want people to hear that if they want, they can, you know, but I don't think it's mandatory, you know. I think if you have a good streaming base, 
you should continue because that's another revenue stream for you, right? Uh, that you can funnel back into whatever you want in your career or just treat yourself, right? If that's enough for that, you know? And I think you should keep it. However, um, if you don't have a big streaming, you know, influx or a presence on streaming, I don't think you should focus on your, your energy on that. You should focus your energy on what's prolific for you, right? Mm -hmm. And not use your time that's very, very, uh, you know, limited and a a precious resource to something that is not working for you. You should focus on finding an alternative. So that's why I make these bold statements. You probably, you maybe saw my tweets or like people are like, oh, this is the Violetta way, whatever. I'm like, yes, this is Violetta way because Violetta doesn't make any money from streaming, you know, and no matter how much effort she puts into it, it's not working. So I'm like, why should I even put my time into that where I could put my time, that time in Web3? So you mentioned um, obviously Nashville and, and Germany and Italy. I'm curious sort of if they influence your music where you are and, and how sort of that really worldly experience has, has shaped your musical direction. Yeah, in one way, you know, um, I feel like the more I moved away from my home country, the more I wanted to embrace it, you know, it's kind of often that way, uh, or maybe, you know, your roots, your music, musical roots, traditions are the one thing that you carry with you when you're away from home, right? For some people, it may be something else, movies or food or whatever. For me, it's the music, you know, obviously, because that's like something I love. And so when I moved to the UK first and then I moved to Berlin, I wanted to bring that part of me with me, you know, to make me feel at home a little bit more, I guess. Um, And I started embracing it, listening to more Italian music than I ever did, you know, old stuff and yeah, embracing it, embracing who I was, you know, uh, originally instead of trying to be. American or like British, which I'm not, you know, I can try, but I'm not, you know, and so, um, yeah, that has influenced a lot. My songwriting, I would say in the way I like compose the melodies, you know, they're, you know, quite European, some of them, you know, they're a little bit like old fashioned and that's a way because the Italian language requires that kind of melody because it has words that end with a vowel with a vowel letter all the time. So they need these more like resolving melodies to fit in. Otherwise it will sound like, you know, British pop or American pop with a language that doesn't fit. So I try to use that approach into my music. I can definitely hear that. I think that anyone else that's listened to uh, any of the songs in your collection, Another Life, I, I think it sounds like a fairy tale. Uh, something out of like an old Disney movie or something. Look, I love Disney movies. I love the songs. I'm so glad you pick it up for sure. I was listening to 101 Dalmatian soundtrack on my free time the other day. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, it's so good. Just quickly, is there a most surreal moment that you can pinpoint across your career where you're like, this is strange? (sighs) Yes, there's a couple. Uh, and it, okay. They both happened at NFT NYC last year and this year, the one that just passed. Um, and it's always when I get to connect with the community in real life. So the first one happened last year after moonshot had just minted out, like not even a month before. Um, and we organized this event the singer songwriter type showcase in New York. Um, and we had, you know, the holders come and use their utility, come in for free and stuff. And I wasn't expecting how many people were going to show up. And, and that was cool already. I was, you know, meeting everybody and for the first time in real life. And then when I sang my first song, I sang my song, never rarely, sometimes always from that collection. And when I got to the chorus, I start singing. Um, if you ask me, do I miss? And the whole room 
start singing like in a choir and I was I was like wait <laughs> like I'm getting teary eye right now right because it's like the biggest thing that for a songwriter you know when people are memorizing your lyrics because they heard them or whatever you know they love it and I was like how did you hear this song like how do you know it you know I literally haven't left my apartment for six months right now I've just sang into my phone you know how could you how could you know the song and everyone knew it from start to finish and I just started crying like in the middle of the song and I just let them finish the song you know I couldn't it was too much so yeah and it kind of happened again this year in a completely different event um and it was crazy because it was in the Bronx I'd never been to the Bronx and it was a hip-hop event so I was actually pretty nervous because I was like I'm gonna go up to that stage and like I'm gonna sing sugar like my song you know it's not I didn't think it was going to resonate, but then I didn't realize that probably all those people had heard me sing so many times that it was empty, like at first in the, in the audience. And then one person starts coming in, you know, they're all like rapper looking dudes, you know, and they start bopping, like vibing, dancing, and then they're all singing along. And again, I'm like this is surreal. So yeah. Wow. Amazing. Yeah, I think that sort of wraps up our questions. It was just such a cool, so cool going in such a deep dive with you. So passionate about music and really cool to hear your story. Thank you guys so much. This episode was proudly brought to you by Massive, building the world's most connected community of artists and fans. Head to massive.fan to find out more about their new platform. 